the idea that you can just go and burn down another piece of the few conceptual pieces we have left before everybody gets an AI on their laptop, right? An AGI on their laptop. There's a few conceptual pieces left, and the idea that anybody can go and grab the next one with their own research lab, that is like highly imprudent, whether it's Sam Altman or anybody. That's the last resource that we have is the gap, the conceptual gap, where people are discovering more things that are going to make AI run very quickly and very powerfully everywhere. The fact that we don't know that yet is the last thing standing between us and doom. And so these guys are just pulling these, pulling the stakes out. We don't know which right. is going to be the last yeah. one to make the, the floor fall out. Right. It's like Jenga, right? So Sora comes along. It's like, oh, look, here's another Jenga piece, right? It's like the video is great. You can generate videos. Yeah. And luckily, everyone was like, you know, oh, yeah. well, that one was crazy. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> hypothetically, this is this is a little, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit impossible, but just for, I think that it's an instructive hypothetical, which is like, imagine that somehow Sora's training got it to the point where um, some of the videos it can do are actually the amount to uh, solving other types of problems embedded in the video domain. Like, so for example, you could give it like a chess problem and be like, show me a video of like a grandmaster winning from this chess position, right? And it can play chess by generating videos, right? Because all of the video generation embeds any other problem, right? You just have to encode it into the as a video generation problem. So you can win chess by asking for a generation of a chess video. Uh, and then you can say, hey, now let's say that I want to make myself the president, right? So give me a video of myself hiring the right campaign manager and, and writing down the right plan to do this, right? So you can embed. So imagine that it just happened to be that Sora was th that last breakthrough that, that pushed us over the hump where it it happened to be attack the angle of drawing all these plans through the video angle. Like you never know, right? So, th so this Jenga block, it seems harmless. It seems like you're pulling a Jenga block from a place that seems safe and you're probably right, but maybe you're not. Maybe the tower is going to collapse. They're wildly underestimating how dangerous each little step they're taking is, right? Because if you told me there has to be a, there's going to be a century of steps that they're taking and they're taking the next step without surveying what people think, I'd be like, yeah, that's fine, whatever, right? But my issue is that I think that each step they're taking is actually burning down a big fraction of the steps we have left before we're dead. And and so do you think it's possible that like the the last step could be something totally unpredictable and like innocuous like Sora or Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. It just, and just like Jenga, right? It's it's literally like the block can look at it sometimes the block looks at and the tower falls down. Absolutely because we don't know what we're doing. Welcome to For Humanity, an AI safety podcast, episode number 17, AI risk equals Jenga. Liron Shapira interview. I'm John Sherman, your host. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the AI safety podcast for the general public. No tech background required. We have some important milestones to recognize here at the start. We just passed more than a thousand YouTube subscribers and have more than 110,000 total video plays on YouTube. That is really exciting. I would stand on the street corner uh, to try to convince one person about AI risk. So I am thrilled by your support and our growing momentum. Let's keep it going. I need you to hit like, subscribe, and share, and keep sending me emails to forhumanitypodcast at gmail.com. I am hearing from people all over the world, and it is so, so encouraging and uplifting. Thank you all. Um, your suggestions and comments are really driving a lot of the future of this show because of some wonderful emails from a viewer in Pakistan. I now use the term AI risk instead of AI safety as often as I can uh, because of an email just this week from a viewer in the Czech Republic. I will now be putting the episode number prominently in the thumbnails from now on. So please keep those emails coming. You really will influence this show. Um, thanks as well to so many of you for your support online over the past week following our weird and wild episode number 16. This week, we're going to get things back on track with a phenomenal guest, AI risk awareness leader, Liron Shapira. Liron's Twitter account describes him as consistently candid AI doom pointer outer. I think that's wonderful. Um, he is constantly putting out pointed, smart, AI risk, social media content, editing short videos, and just has in general become an important voice in the AI risk social media debate that mainly rages on Twitter. Um, and he knows what he's talking about. Liron is a current California-based tech company CEO, an angel investor in tech companies, 
um, a father of three, and he is a rationalist. Uh, I want to keep this show focused solely on extinction risk. Um, so we're not going to get too much into rationalism here, but Leron does talk about it a bit in the show. Uh, and there's a blog called Less Wrong um, that relates to this. I'll put a link in the description for those who want to learn more about rationalism. So Sora, OpenAI's text-to-video Marvel came out last week, and wow. Uh, as someone who makes their living in video production, I can tell you it is both amazing and terrifying but I am committing everyone here at my company to learning how to use AI tools with video as best we absolutely can. We need to master it like any new tool in our world. But it's not just a tool. In my conversation with Liron, I was surprised by his very rational answer to the question of, is Sora itself potentially an existential threat? I did not expect his answer of yes. Here is my conversation with Liron Shapira. Hey, John, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, thanks for waiting. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I haven't watched your podcast yet. Do you have a few episodes out? I do. I have, uh, this will be the 17th show and oh, wow. I'm right. a week. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a pretty serious pace. I'm I'm learning. <laughs> nice. Here, I'll download it on my player. I listen to a lot of podcasts, so that'll be interesting. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm basically just a uh, former journalist uh, who is a concerned dad, um, mm -hmm. and you know, like a lot of us, I think, just trying to figure out what we can do to help. And so I started this podcast in November and trying to grow it. And uh, you know, the response has been really, really encouraging. Nice. And what are you concerned about? So it's basically just general AI existential risk. Um, I am concerned gravely that, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is going to cause all of us to not be here within right. um, okay. our lifetimes. And, and you know, I uh, can't believe that anyone's talking about anything else. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm looking at your playlist. Yeah. Yeah, damn, I should have gone on this earlier. This is some good stuff. Oh, nice. He did Theo Jaffe. He's a smart guy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just trying to talk to people who are, you know, involved in this. And like, really my goal is the most shocking thing to me in coming to this, you know, from the outside, like I read Ellie Eisner's article in March and that was my wake up call. I had no clue about it. I read the article and that night I was just like, I can't. And which, which, which year was this again? Uh, in 23 and in, in March 23, oh, wow. his piece okay. in Time Magazine, you know, right. yeah. Um, and it just, that was your first my treasure. Tracks. First exposure, oh, wow. just totally, uh, you know, had no clue about it other than that, um, just living my life and was like, holy shit, uh, <laughs> this seems like the most serious thing ever. Like he's saying that, you know, this is what is going to happen. This is what the default setting is uh, on our right. course. And I, I just found that um, shocking. And so I just went down the, you know, the rabbit hole and listen to all the Lex podcasts and all the future life podcasts and everything. And I couldn't find anything to be like, no, Ellie Eisner's wrong. Right, 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 right. Cool. Okay, great. I just downloaded a bunch of episodes. Awesome. Awesome. So let, let's start out just talking a little bit about you because um, I have certainly come across you throughout my, you know, several months in, in this AI risk um, debate. How'd you get involved in the tech world and, and how did you um, get caught up in AI risk? So I've been a software engineer pretty much my whole life. Started programming when I was very young. Uh, studied computer science in college. Studied theoretical computer science just as a graduate level elective type of thing. Um, and then I worked in industry for a few years. Uh, I had a startup that raised a bunch of money and failed. Uh, I run another company right now that was a Y Combinator startup, uh, and it's uh, you know it oh, wow. turned into a uni unicorn, but it's a profitable business. It's called Relationship Hero. So okay. My natural affiliation is techno optimist, transhumanist, software entrepreneur. Um, that's that's kind of my niche. Um, even the people who call themselves EAC, I mean, that is kind of my default vibe. Like I get where they're coming from. Um, but as early as 2007, when I was uh, a, in a junior in college, I started reading Less Wrong, which was overcoming bias at the time, and it really shocked me to my core uh, at the time, just the quality of the writing. And I know it's not for everybody, right? A lot of people seem to really bounce off it and they can't get into it. But for yep. me, I was just like, 
I can't even believe this writing exists. This is making so much sense compared to anything else I've ever read. Like it's really connecting ideas, the amount of disparate concepts that Eliezer has woven together into like a very coherent synthesis that the rest of the world slowly is catching up to, right? Even things like, okay, using probabilities, that's slowly been seeping into the world over the last two decades. Uh, you know, knowledge of human biases, self-awareness in that sense, just like all these little ideas that he seeded so long ago, he was already yeah. far ahead of where the conversation is today, the stuff that I was reading in 2007. So having that groundwork, it's hard to even imagine what my mental life would be like without laying that foundation. It's the single most influential work that I ever read. And luckily I did it just as I was kind of becoming an adult. So um, so I've been like aware of the AI risk issue. And as you can see on Twitter, I'm just you know casually observing all these developments, right? I don't program the AI myself. Um, you know, I did in college a little bit for class, right? I would make simple AIs. Um, and like I, I could work on it if I wanted to, right? But I'm more of a casual observer just saying, okay, what are the implications of all these things that are coming out, right? Like how are they taking us toward AGI and super intelligence? And is this playing out like I feared? And then unfortunately, it seems like the answer is yes. So that's kind of like my, my story in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your what is your general perspective on on AI X risk? Um, you have a natural footing in, in, you know, optimism. And I think I do, too. Like, I, like I'm an optimist and I love technology. I use technology all the time. I've been doing video production for 20 years. And like, you know, I'm all about technology. I just am not into technology that's going to kill my kids. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's, and it seems like your other guests are on the same page, but it's just, you know, I keep hearing the other side of the debate, you know, the EAC or the non-doomers or the optimists, whatever they want to call themselves. Like, I've never been a pessimist. I think that distinction is, is so ridiculous, right? It's like, I am a techno-optimist. If you take AI out of the equation, I'm bullish on VR, right? I, I think I expect to be using VR when the quality is a little bit better. You know, bullish on self-driving, colonizing Mars, like, it's all great. I'm a transhumanist, right? I want to upload to the simulation. All good. Just one little fly in the ointment is I think AI is literally going to kill everybody soon. Right? Beside that part doesn't seem great, right? Whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, you got to address the problem, right? And then I'm optimistic that if we were to actually admit that there's a problem and then address it sanely, then we would have a shot, right? And so like I, I'm not particularly pessimistic about that hypothetical, but it's just it just seems like we are currently moving directly toward doom, right? Just as a realistic assessment of where we are. So unless we change it, I guess I'm not optimistic about the trajectory that just seems right where we're headed. And and let's talk about the word optimism, the term optimism, because it makes me crazy that the accelerationists think that they own that term. Like if, if yeah. we're in a car that's heading off a cliff, it's not optimistic to say, let's speed up. Right. Yeah. So the key distinction is just between like... Um, the right optimism seems like just optimism toward like, we can do this if we try. And the wrong type of optimism is like, let's just hope there's no problem. Yeah. Let's just hope there's no problem. And don't you say there is, because if you say there is, you're a pessimist, you're a doomer, toughen up. Right? It's like, it's, right, it's yeah. there's like a bullying attitude in, in the whole EAC vibe. Yeah. And I, and I resent the term decel, like, no, I'm not like for deceleration in general. Just if literally something is going to kill you, like the bullet that's coming to kill you, that one particular exception, I would decelerate the bullet. Um, and yeah, and you know, it's it just it sucks because it's modern Bailey, right? So the the Bailey, um, or I guess, I guess the Bailey is is them saying let's accelerate AI, but the mod, the part that's highly defensible, is just techno optimism. Techno optimism is great, and the world needs so much more techno optimism. So it's it's pretty infuriating to see that they have this rallying cry that most of us doomers agree with. It's like, yeah, let's accelerate technology in general. Yeah, great. That's a great rallying try. That's a great mod, right? So it's a frustrating yeah. situation. But l luckily, you know, most of the world is not in this bubble. Most of the world has no idea what EAC is. Most of the world isn't even techno-optimist, which is unfortunate, but it's just like EAC is not speaking to most of the world. Yeah, yeah. Y you're out there. You're, are you in California? You're out there uh, sort of immersed living with tech people, going to the grocery store with them? Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm based in San Jose, so my natural bubble is tech Twitter, basically, right? That's my crowd. Uh, but that said, I do get exposure to non-tech people, and it's consistent with what I'm seeing the survey saying, which is like their default response when you tell them about AI doom is like, oh, wow, yeah, AI is scary. That does sound scary. I'm pretty worried about that. Uh, the main thing that they don't get is they don't get that the AI labs are racing to create the thing we don't understand and hit the gas, and then it's going to be too late. Like, they don't understand the urgency of the issue. 
they're basically yeah. just by default, they're basically techno pessimist, which isn't a reliable mental algorithm. Like it kind of sucks that they're techno pessimist, but they happen to be getting the right answer in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. It, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible to think that like, um, to say we're speeding off a cliff, we should decelerate is like something negative. Uh, and, and so how do these people, how do they do it? Like, how do the guys that are going to work every day at OpenAI go into these companies? Obviously, surveys show that a good percentage of them have some idea that what they're toying with, you know, has potentially uh, existential consequences. Those surveys are really, you know, high with the percentage of AI workers who say they understand the risks they're taking. How does someone come back to work the next day if the boss says we have a 10 to 25 percent chance of killing every living thing on Earth yesterday? Let's all come back tomorrow. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's a, f a few ways to reconcile the the motivation there, right? So one is just some people in the company are like, ah, it's a pretty small risk, whatever. Um, and even the people who are like, oh, it's a 25% risk. Well, let's just, you know, we can't do better anyway, right? Like the world is so screwed that let's just, a 75% chance of success is pretty good. Let's take it. Now, unfortunately, I think the chance is a lot lower than 75%, right? I think the, the P-doom is higher than 25%, but there might just be people who, who take their boss's word for it and be like, okay, 25%, I'm working on the 75%, let's plow forward, right? And then because if we if we succeed, at least we'll get to heaven. So I'm gambling on a 75% chance of heaven, which is, you know, not ideal, but it's not the worst gamble in the world. But the problem is, like I said, it's just, I think that those odds are understated, right? But that, that would explain some motivation. And another way to explain the motivation is, is people who say like, I don't like gambling on a 75% chance, but the game theory is, you know, the only way out is through. So we have to go through. So it's not even a question, right? This is going to happen anyway. There's no coordination that we can do. Somebody's going to build it. So we have to be first, right? So there's that motivation. Um, and then, of course, there's people who just disagree with the probability or they think that the doom scenario isn't that bad. Um, and I think, look, if I had to um, if I had to just give a single summary answer, though, I think it's just kind of like people snap to defaults where they're kind of like socially aligned, right? Like, it is a socially appropriate thing to do when you have a job and you're being paid a lot, right? It's kind of a high status job in our society, like half a million or a million dollars a year, in some cases more, right? When that's your job and you have a nice office building, you have nice benefits and your boss says, go write this code. It's very, the default thing is you just go and write the code, right? Like the, the controversy is more of a hypothetical, it's more intellectual. So it's easy to compartmentalize. That is so fascinating because I would think that like they would have a better understanding of the threat just being immersed in the work um yeah. and and that at 25 even at 10 percent, like like right. what do you think is an acceptable risk percentage to end all life on earth like you know i talked to roman Yapolsky on one of the shows and he talks about zero is the only acceptable well, percentage i that could is, be con i could be out. convinced that any percent is acceptable if we don't if we don't have a better alternative right so if you're saying like hey doom is so likely in the next hundred years so our best Hail Mary is a 50-50 gamble. If that's our best Hail Mary, fine. The issue I'm seeing is just that the default trajectory of the world without AI, yeah, there's going to be a, an asteroid impact in the next 100 million years, yes, and right, and the sun is going to burn out in a billion years, right? So yes, we have these long-term things coming that we better get ready for. Um, but in the next 100 years, we're for the default outcome is we're going to do fine. Like it's it's 2100 without AI is going to be better than 2024 uh, with, our, with our current level of AI. So if that's the default and people are saying we need AI in the next five to 20 years, we need to go, the only way out is through, then that's clearly a false claim to me. Like we have more time than five to 20 years. We have like a couple centuries on the default trajectory. Maybe we even have yeah. the onion, right? So, I, yeah. so the, the timeline just doesn't add up for the people who are saying like there's no choice. Like there's clearly a choice to delay AI's trajectory. And the thing is that, um, you know, somebody who makes Dolly work or who makes the new Sora model work, Right. It's like that's that's great that you made that work, but that doesn't give you the perspective of how you're getting closer to the threshold where AI becomes a superhuman general intelligence. It doesn't help you zoom out like that and, and see why what you're doing is dangerous. Ran. And and they don't even so so proximity to it can almost do the opposite, right? You're obscured by the close yeah. thing you're look working on. Oh, yeah. And and this is, I mean, the thing is, this is already the default perspective that observers take. Like, observers don't have the context that I've gotten from my education in AI safety. Like, they don't have the context that this is all coming relative to the human brain. When you have something that's smarter than human, 
and it can achieve goals, there are runaway cascades. As a matter of pure logic, that's something that wants to optimize the universe is going to have all these implications of all these things it has to do, right? It has to seize power. And that's the kind of perspective that I'm seeing, right? But when you're just working on making the image generator better, right? Then in your mind, you're seeing the same thing that outside observers see. Like, oh, OpenAI made an image generator. Cool, right? Like, you're not seeing it in context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I don't work at a tech company, so I, I don't know how that mind works. But to think that it could be, you know, so correct on one part of it and then so just walling off the other is, is amazing. But I'm sure, you know, it's just human nature, right? You, you just sort of see what you want to see in a lot of to- a lot of cases. I mean, it's it's the the argument is very much. I mean, look, Eliezer Yudkowsky kind of brought forth the argument for things like instrumental convergence, orthogonality. I mean, he didn't originate everything, but he did pull together the strands very nicely. And when he did it in uh, early two thousands, it was quite a big shock, right? It took a very long time for for people like Jeff Hinton, Max Tagmark, right, the, these acknowledged unbiased intellectual giants to come out and be like, "Hey, this makes sense," right? It took two decades. All right, and and yeah. in principle, the Eliezer's exact argument could have been made in the time of Turing, right? And Turing hinted at it a little bit, right? Turing te- Turing sensed that there was some issue, right? But the way that Eliezer broke it down into kind of sub principles and is now getting a lot of validation from a, a large percentage of the AI industry, right? I forget about the general public. I mean, these things sometimes humans just don't see things that are conceptually quite simple and obvious once you know them, and yet humans just don't hit on them for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I have a, I have a ton of questions for you, but let's, let's talk about parenting, parenting if we can. So, you know, do you talk to your, your kids are younger, right? Your kids are, are, you know, mine are old enough. So they're basically adults ish, but, um, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, uh, my son, I talk to about it a good amount. My daughter, I don't, uh, my wife, I don't like, I, I just, you know, you go sort of talk where people want to hear it. I feel like, and then sometimes you feel like, if people are in your life and you just feel like they're really pushing it away, I, you know, it's hard to sort of bring it with a heavy hand. Why, why would you, how do you deal with your family, your wife, your kids talking about this stuff? Um, yeah, I know so I, that, you know, where your head's at with it. So I do have three kids, but the youngest one's not even, uh, the oldest one's not even five yet. So there's kind of no, there's kind of no point. No, right, so there's no conversation. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and then with my wife, I mean, she knows I'm into the AI doom stuff, right? She she kind of knows what my worldview is. Uh, and we randomly will get into it a little bit. But it's just like, she's just, it's not really her thing to reason about these kind of things, right? Like, Which is like most people, right? Most people are like, okay, yeah, I, I get that AI is scary. I get, I get that you have some points. And you may even be right. But, you know, what, how does that relate to me? Like, I'm not going to be the person who lobbies to save the world. Like, the grown-ups of society yep. better figure this out. And if they don't, then I'm going to die. Fine. Well, let me just focus on today. Can, yeah, that's what it is. And isn't it um, kind of shocking and disappointing that, you know, all of the humans that have come before us, all their sacrifice, like, I think about, like, you know, generations of humans that put had led awful lives horrible lives of suffering right. to get us to where we are today and we're just going to drop the ball casually because we're just like oh well it's it's ridiculous right i mean look i'm, I'm not the most emotional person right I, I see it as more of just like an interesting problem to solve or just like an arbitrage or just like um hey look at all this like tr- you know trillions quadrillions universe level value that's about to go into the dumpster i just see it as it really just raises my radar of like um there's like a major order of magnitude mismatch here right like hey you're throwing the future into a dumpster like for me that's just kind of like a it's almost like a numerical thing, like what's going on, right? Like my gauges are are going way way out of way off the charts. What's going on here, right? So I kind of intellectualize it like that. But yeah, if you want to get emotional about it, it's like all the sacrifices, right, that everybody's made, that your ancestors made to give you a good life, right? All the sacrifices that we are making for our kids. It is true that we're about to press the game over button, right? And like how it all be for nothing. What do you think would happen if everybody knew that? If if everyone on Earth or everyone in America yeah. understood what you and I understand, I mean, I feel like the default reaction is to go hard on regulation, right? I mean, that's what we do with other things that we get squeamish about, right? I mean, like environmental regulations, right? Nuclear energy regulations, right? So that it does seem like the government has a mode where it loves to regulate things if it gets squeamish, or like human cloning, right? Now, in this case, we need more than that. We need international treaties. But like, I think humans are okay at regulation when they get squeamish, and the problem is that AI. 
uh, I think the problem is AI feels so clean. You know what I mean? Like it feels so clean and innocent and fundamentally harmless, right? Like bits on a computer, they're just yeah. made of harmless stuff. Yeah. So I think that's the problem is we're not fully getting the squeamishness. But I'm hearing that with like Sora, with video models, with people getting displaced out of jobs. I think people are getting not exactly squeamish, but they're starting to get like scared. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm commenting on how I think people intuitively perceive the AI threat. And, and like I said, one issue is it's not really squeamish. Like it's not like a big dragon that's going to get you. It's just like a, a clean piece of code. But at the same time, it's slowly advancing to to be more threatening like the Terminator. And it's also advancing toward the, the thing of like, hey, it's more smart and valuable than you, right? And somebody with a low IQ has more life experience knowing what it's like when there's another individual who's like, how does this individual always run circles around me at the office, right? How are they always producing more, like saying better stuff to the boss? How are they doing that, right? And like, you know, I, I like to think I have a high IQ, so I, I don't have that experience too much personally, but like, I do think that that's the experience of people with a low IQ of just like, look, the world is pretty tough and other people are like beating me at these competitions, right? And I think that a lot of the world's population is now getting that sense with AI of like, oh, damn it. It's just like what the smarter humans are doing to me. This AI is doing to me now too. And they're actually right on that front. They're actually getting a better sense of what AI is going to do to humanity as a whole, whereas smart people aren't getting that sense yet because like, no, I'm still, I'm still the chief here, right? I'm still dominant over this AI. So the smart right. people are actually getting a misleading sense of what the AI is about to do to them. The smart people are about to be hit by a truck. Like, yeah, I mean, we, we all are, right? But the, but the smart people we don't all see are. what's coming. Yeah. The stupid people currently have a better intuition for what AI is doing. Eesh. And that's just sort of a bias, a constancy bias. A, you know, everything's always been like this. So, of course, it will be tomorrow bias. I mean, the, the stupid people just get what it means for a smarter agent to come and mess with you. <laughs> like that happens to them all the time. <laughs> or to like not be able to navigate a world populated by these smarter agents. Right? It's like for them, it's wow. to like right. read the terms of service, right? If you're like the duck whose eggs always get stolen by the fox, you're like, oh, crap, the fox got me again. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they, it's just, and, and that's, but that's more of the unemployment threat, right? That's more of like the mundane types of threats, but they can also generalize it to be like, yeah, I might also take over the world and like enslave you too. Like that's like a, a shorter hop. Right. So this is something that I think is wild is the good case scenario, right? The like, if everything goes according to their plans scenario is something I think most people would reject out of hand. Like I, I have just in the last couple of months started to understand like, okay, so we have free energy because we get fusion. We have free labor uh, you know, goods and services are, are near free because a computer can do for free any job that a human could do. So it costs, you know, a couple thousand dollars to lead um, upper middle class lifestyle anywhere on earth. 90% of the people don't work like all of these. Each one of these things is so massively revolutionary. This idea that we're just going to sort of race through this and it's going to be OK seems absolutely insane to me. I wonder if there's not a case to be made that like the good case at this speed is maybe a more effective argument for the common person to be for right. stopping or slowing down. I mean, it's true that the average person is even just scared of change, right? So even when you just say like, yeah, life's going to be good, even though like AI is doing your job, you'll maybe you'll have a universal basic income or something. And they'll be like, oh, I don't trust that, right? So like there's all kinds of fears we can play on. I personally don't go that route. I never open my mouth to be like, you're about to lose your job, you know, because that's, it's just not the crux of the issue. And it's not even what I believe. If I just thought that AI was always going to be safe and was always going to basically have human compatible values, was always going to love humanity, right? If you gave me that as a, as a premise, then I would pretty much be an AI optimist. I'd be like, yeah, okay, we're going to have to rethink human employment because AI probably can do every job. And like, we might just have to, you know, just have a big party and, and like kill jobs like that. That's a risk that I'm willing to take, right, to, to be able to just have anything we want. I'm, I'm willing to take that risk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how do you deal with your day to day? Like how much of your time do you devote to AI risk awareness? Like, is that the work you're doing, trying to make people aware? How do you how do you characterize the AI risk work you're doing and how much of your life does it consume? So yeah, it's it's been informal. I'm becoming more involved with the Pause AI organization. I've done a couple of protests, um, and I try to do as much podcast debates and media as I can. So 
it's becoming like a third of my life and two thirds is still my day job, but I'm open to make it half or more right? because I think it's just so important. Um, and it's just like, I, I can't, I can't really focus on startups right now when I just think that we have, you know, a short time to live. I mean, my P doom is 50% by 2040. So it's just like, I, I see my own personal, uh, best contribution, I think is on the communication side. So podcasts like this, you know, as, as prominently as possible, I guess. Um, and basically just like explaining to the world the urgency of the issue, right? Because it's like the people are already on the pause AI side. That's what surveys show, but they just don't get the urgency of the issue. They don't get that they have to act now. Uh, and I think that, uh, I guess my own talent is like some combination of like understanding why we're doomed and also being able to speak in like a pretty accessible way. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I, I just thank you for doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it. And I think a, a challenge for the AI safety risk movement, whatever you want to call it, is that um, a lot of the best communicators, Ellie Eiser, Connor Leahy, Max Tegmark, Bengio, all these guys may not be the best vehicle to translate this to the common person. Uh, you know, like I, I've said, totally. when, when this thing is on the Today Show, if it's Ellie Eiser presenting it, um, as much as I love and respect him, I think we're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, I've made the comparison where when we're at the stage of the game where Eliezer, the, you know, the person who wrote the corpus and, and outlined the, the bedrock uh, theoretical foundations of what the problem is, when he has to come on and do media, it's like we're at, it's as if we're in the stage of World War II when Werner von Braun has to go to the front lines. Yeah. Yeah. Like those guys should be off doing their work. There should that, be a team yeah, of and, and if that's happening, it's like you're screwed, right? That, that does not mean the war has gone well. And that's where we are today. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you feel about the terms AI safety and AI risk? They kind of make me crazy. So AI safety is a, a disaster for me because, it, A, it's boring, right? It's It just seems so – there's nothing interesting about th that together at all. But it's like AI safety makes it seem like it's safe. Like, it's like AI safety. Oh, AI is safe. Like, no, not at all. You know, like like AI yeah. safety makes it seem like the default is everything's okay. That's not right. Yeah. AI risk is like everything is risky. You know, I, right. I, I'm looking that, that's for a good another point. No, Yeah, that it's a good point that when you hear that there's a topic called AI safety, it kind of frames it in your head as like, oh, okay, so we just have to avoid that bottom worst case scenario where it's not safe or even the bottom 50% where it's not safe. Whereas the real problem is like, uh, well, it's actually 99.9% .9 chance it's not going to be safe and nobody knows how to make it safe. So I, I agree that the natural framing when you even hear the term AI safety is misleading. Yeah, I don't know what's it like, AI slaughter? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I don't, I mean, what is the term? And even, and, even, and even risk, right? as you say, kind of implies when you even talk about risk, you're usually not talking about like a 99% risk. Right? You're usually talking about like a manageable risk. Right, right. So what do you think about uh, government? Like, do you have any hope that the U.S. government, that international organizations uh, could make meaningful change in time? Uh, yeah, I think that we could use the nuclear proliferation playbook, right? If we all get, you know, get, if, if, if we all see Jesus, right? really fast. Um, I think there's some hope, but I think every day that passes, we're burning down the remaining timeline in terms of, you know, we're getting closer and closer to having the conceptual insight to just have AI everywhere and be uncontrollable. So every day we're losing our, you know, our, t we're losing time. And even if we were all focused, it would be really hard to, to prevent everybody from developing AI. It would only buy us a few years anyway. So I think that my recommended proposal is a proposal that has low hope, right? Which is like, let's coordinate to pause. And then at the same time, I mean, I'm basically just parroting uh, Ali Azra's suggestion here, which is like, okay, let's coordinate to pause as best we can and then do like human intelligence augmentation, basically, as well as theoretical safety research, right? So you basically just race as, as far as we can, because that's the problem right now is we're losing the race, losing the race against time, losing the race against AI capabilities. That's the thing that people are trying to stick their head in the sand and not see that we're losing this critical race. Yeah. Man, so you think human augmentation is is the only course that seems terrifying i mean there's human augmentation and then there, there's like theoretical safety research and you know everybody's saying the line like oh miri the machine intelligence research issue they worked on it for 15 years and they accomplished nothing and like no they didn't accomplish nothing they accomplished a nice little trickle of 
foundational zero paradigm level insights, right? Like huge breakthroughs. Uh, it's just, it's still a drop in the bucket because we need it even more. Yeah. Is there any chance we would discover something new in our development of AI that would like jump us ahead of it somehow that, that we could, you know? Yeah, it, it doesn't somehow seem like a problem. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a problem with, with a cracking open solution. I mean, a, a problem that I often make an analogy to that I'm somewhat familiar myself is the problem of proving P doesn't equal NP, you know, P versus NP in math. Uh, it's the one of the Millennium Prize problems. You get a million dollars if you prove it. Um, it's arguably the most important open problem in math because kind of all the other problems reduce to saying, hey, can are, can things be efficiently provable or efficiently searchable? Anyway, so P versus NP is this big problem. And if you look at all the progress toward proving P versus NP, a lot of the progress takes the form of all discovering extra constraints of why it's going to be so hard to prove it, right? So like decades of research is like, oh, okay, I found a new reason why it's going to be hard. I found a new type of category of proof that's not going to work. And these are like real insights. Like we're seeing more and more of the like lasers in, in you know, the evil person's lair that you, have, that you have to go crawl through. It's like, oh, there's a laser here, there's a laser here, right? It's hard for these reasons. And that's what's going on with AI right now. We're illuminating slowly more and more of how fiendishly hard it is. And that's great. But the last thing you want to do when you're in this illumination stage is be like, all right, let's go in now. Right. Like you would think there would be a, there would have been a moment where there could have been like a um, taking stock of like, okay, here's what it is. But it seems like there's no taking stock. It's to, the, the pace of it is just so nuts. One day rolls into the next and you know, I'm an outside observer. I cannot imagine yeah. what it's like inside right. watching this thing. Yeah, the pace is crazy high, which normally is cool for tech. I mean, for computer chips in general, for VR, you know, it's exciting to see a fast pace. And that's that's how tech usually gives us nice things. Just the problem here is there's no undo button, right? There's no debugging phase when you make your AI uncontrollable. I like to tell people that this thing is just different than anything ever before, right? That this, this totally. thing is fundamentally different. But I feel like um, from what you're saying and what I'm observing, like in the tech community... This is just another software or something. Like nobody's making. Yeah, I'm, that's right. It's which is great. I mean, it's very much a midwit phenomenon, right? Because if you ask the average person, it's it's pretty easy for them to agree. Like, yes, a super intelligent AI seems like a big deal, even more so than other tech. Um, and if you, but that if you go to a tech person, like you say, their whole lives, their whole intuition has been built with the background assumption that every tech they build is not existentially threatening. It never has been. Right, so that yeah. AI comes along and they just bring out all the same intuitions that they use for the non-existentially threatening tech. Like they don't see that this is an edge case. So, another question I have is, what qualifies the guy Sam Altman, who was running Y Combinator, right, and and you know, investing in tech companies and working with tech startup leaders and all this stuff? What qualifies this guy to have his finger on the kill eight billion people machine? Like, like, right? I mean. Yeah, you know, it's I don't want to make it personal, right? Like, arguably, no single any of individual them. human is, is qualified, yeah. right? But it's just like, I mean, yeah, so this, because of the nature of the coordination problem, which, to his credit, Sam and OpenAI, they've said this themselves. They're like, this needs to be regulated, right? There needs to be a IAEA, like a nuclear regulatory agency, telling us what we can and can't do, because it shouldn't just be like one arbitrary human. It should just be like, you know, a, a coordinated body of human regulators that you know, have been democratically elected and appointed. I mean, the best mechanisms that we have to get people that are somewhat trustworthy, right, as good as we can do, right, on a, on a commission so that one guy can't go crazy. Um, and, and yeah, and have those people push the button. Yeah, absolutely, right? And ideally have those people supervise like a Manhattan Project. I mean, the Manhattan Project was arguably done pretty responsibly. Like, it, you know, you could nitpick it and you can say, like, yep. we have dropped the nuke. But, you know, it looks like the adults were actually in charge, like making a lot of adult decisions along the way. Like, they did more good decisions than bad decisions, in my opinion. Um, yeah. And having that same sort of top-down adults in the room, let's try to make good decisions and coordinate because this, this is the best we can do. Like, the this, this situation is so urgent. This is how we have to do it. Um, that would be the ideal. And then you compare what we have today, which is, oh, okay, for-profit companies are allowed to just do research themselves and there's not much regulation yet on what they're doing and then what lets sam Altman do it i mean it's it's not even about sam right it's just about like no i don't think a single individual human right now without the single you know without being part of a single coordinated manhattan project that's weighing risks and benefits very carefully and that's treading very cautiously unless you're part of that the idea that you can just go and burn down 
another piece of the few conceptual pieces we have left before everybody gets an AI on their laptop, right? An AGI on their laptop. There's a few conceptual pieces left and the idea that anybody can go and grab the next one with their own research lab, that is like highly imprudent, whether it's Sam Altman or anybody. That's the last resource that we have is the gap, the conceptual gap where people are discovering more things that are going to make AI run very quickly and very powerfully everywhere. The fact that we don't know that yet is the last thing standing between us and doom. And so these guys are just pulling these, pulling the stakes out. We don't know which right. is going to be the last exactly. one to make the, the floor fall out. Right. It's like Jenga, right? So Sora comes along. It's like, oh, look, here's another Jenga piece, right? It's like the video is great. You can generate videos. Yeah. But luckily. Everyone was like, you know, oh, yeah. that one was crazy. <laughs> right. I mean, hypothetically, this is this is a little, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit implausible, but just for, I think that it's an instructive hypothetical, which is like, imagine that somehow Sora is training got it to the point where um, some of the videos it can do are actually the amount to uh, solving other types of problems embedded in the video domain. Like, so for example, you could give it like a chess problem and be like, show me a video of like a grandmaster winning from this chess position, right? And it can play chess by generating videos, right? Because all of the video generation embeds any other problem, right? You just have to encode it into the as a video generation problem. So you can win chess by asking for a generation of a chess video. Uh, and then you can say, hey, now let's say that I want to make myself the president, right? So give me a video of myself hiring the right campaign manager and, and writing down the right plan to do this, right? So you can embed. So imagine that it just happened to be that Sora was th that last breakthrough that that pushed us over the hump where it it happened to be attack the angle of drawing all these plans through the video angle. Like you never know, right? So, th so this Jenga block, it seems harmless. It seems like you're pulling a Jenga block from a place that seems safe and you're probably right, but maybe you're not. Maybe the tower is going to collapse. That's a great, uh, that's a great metaphor is Jenga. Uh, and yeah, and, yeah everyone and, gets it. And, and every block represents like a, a new concept, right? And there's a finite number of concepts that we don't understand yet that once we understand them, then we'll be doomed unless you argue like, ah, oh, but then we'll need a lot of computing power. And I'd be like, no, you just need like one more Jenga block to tell you how to need less computing power. So there's using today's hardware. I'm convinced that there's a small number of Jenga blocks that'll just tell you how to efficiently make super intelligent AI on today's hardware that is uncontrollable. What do you think the CEOs think? Like, like um, Sam Altman has written, you know, 2015 stuff that seems like he gets it, but you know, <laughs> you get here to today and you have all the major CEOs, even the, you know, the heads of Google and, and Microsoft, you know, are all bought in and just stroke it endless checks. Like it seems, uh, People look at it and they're like, how could the smartest people in the world kill themselves? Mm -hmm. That yeah, so true. I think that I could probably pass the, you know, the ideological Turing test, you know, that concept. Yeah. Um, so if if I had to pretend to be them and, you know, state their position, defend it, I'd just be like, um, look, the the P doom is there. I think it's lowish. Let's say it's ten percent. Um, and we have to be very careful. But, you know, it's not gonna happen next year. Like we have some time. And right now, the prudent thing to do is to build the infrastructure to monitor things really well and like take one more step and reevaluate. You know, you can't just stop. You got to take a step, reevaluate, take a step, reevaluate. And that's what we're doing. We're really good at taking little steps and reevaluating. And we have the smartest people in the world evaluating this stuff. And if it ever gets super crazy, then yeah, I'm open to stopping. But for now, you're being, you know, too alarmist. You're the first alarm, right? It's, it's like an, an overly aggressive alarm. And like, let me take another step. Don't they realize that it is a few thousand people doing this to eight billion people without the eight billion people's consent? Like, like, don't isn't the notion of consent required here in some way? Yeah. So I I, I think that the they would say, um, like, yes, we want the people's consent, and we're soliciting a lot of feedback from the people, and we don't think that we're doing anything. We get that the people don't want to die, and that's why we're being so careful about safety. Right. So in their mind, they're just like, look, taking a step is fine. And if it gets crazy, then yeah, in the interest of safety, we'll stop. But besides that, like the, the people don't really know what they want better than our, our, our own team is able to draft like some principles. Right. If you look at like the, the charter for uh, for Anthropics AI, right, they have constitutional AI. It's like, look, the stuff we put in our constitution is from like the UN Human Rights Charter. Right. It's stuff that a lot of humans have agreed about. So it's just like we we basically know what humans want. Like, I don't see what's the point of doing another vote right now. They think they know what humans want. They think they that humans yeah. want eighty percent of the jobs switched out in the next ten, twenty years, and they're 
they are so wrong. Like, like in government, if you want to switch, you know, 5% of the jobs in one category, right? Let's mm-hmm. say you said, we want to uh, take teachers and, and reduce the, you know, number of teachers by 5%, you'd have hearings and bills and all sorts yeah, of sure. like so, stuff about but- it. So, yeah, my, my own position, though, is I'm not just like, hey, we need to, like, use more bureaucracy, and that's the reason why OpenAI and all these labs are being irresponsible, because they're not using all the bureaucracy. That's not really my my big objection, right? Like, I, I'm open to arguments that they don't have to do that. Um, my objection is just that they're wildly underestimating how dangerous each little step they're taking is, right? Because if you told me there has to be, a, there's going to be a century of steps that they're taking, and they're taking the next step without surveying what people think, I'd be like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. Right. But my issue is that I think that each step they're taking is actually burning down a big fraction of the steps we have left before we're dead. And and so do you think it's possible that like the the last step could be something totally unpredictable and like innocuous, like Sora or Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. There's... Absolutely. It just, and just like Jenga, right? It's it's literally like the block can look at it. Sometimes the block looks at and the tower falls down. Absolutely, because we don't know what we're doing. Right. We don't know what these models are capable of. Uh Yarn Talin had a good interview about this where he talked to a bunch of people in the AI labs and they're like, look, everybody admits that there's a 1% chance that when you t- uh, train something that's 10x bigger than GPT-4, let's say, at that scale, there's like a 1% chance that it gets good enough to escape and go uncontrollable. Like no- nobody can assure you that the that the model plateaus in its intelligence when you just scale it up. Right. They've been surprised again and again, right? That's why we got here. Right. And, and look, the, we don't understand how our own human brain works, right? We don't understand how the AIs that we build work. We don't understand how our own brain works. And now we're scaling it up. Like it's very much, you know, uh, it's it's like we really should know better. So all, all the CEOs, right? Zuckerberg, Sam Altman, Bill Gates, all these guys um, say they are taking us to a world of abundance. And yet they're all building these these hundred million dollar castles in the ground that are literal like monuments to scarcity what is that about how how, uh, how how are the guys leading us to abundance building their backup plans in no, case? yeah you're talking about their bunkers yeah yeah, yeah I mean, bunkers. that <laughs> so i mean when i when i analyze that it's just for me what's salient is they just well, I think a big part of it is probably just that, like, they think it's, like, a fun hobby, right? I, I'm sure if you ask them, like, what is the probability that this is actually going to be, like, a relevant part of your life plan, they're probably going to be, like, I don't know, 1%, right? Like, okay. I, I think it's more like... It's like a sports like, car, just a big sports car? I think it's a big sport. I mean, it's, like, think about how passionate Mark is about, you know, raising cows and barbecuing them, and he, like, learned Chinese. Like, these guys tend to have, like, a lot of passionate hobbies, you know? Okay. Okay. All right. I have a darker view on it, which is sort of, like... That, you know, that maybe there's an interim period where everybody knows we're screwed. Everybody knows it's their fault, but we're still here. Uh, and there's an interim period of of chaos and they're looking for right. a place to lay low. I would be pretty surprised if they have like elaborate plans for the bunker, right? Like I'm sure that in their head, you know, they, they have the kind of brain that likes to go noodle over it, right? On their downtime and, and, make ideas but like i i doubt that they have like you know a planning commission right like that would that would be pretty shocking to me to be like here's my team that then plans how the bunker goes down and be like whoa okay that's more serious than i thought they were digging it right because i mean surely they know that like um you know there's something they couldn't imagine a weapon designed by an intelligence way smarter than them that you know is not yeah. limited by their imagination that could make something to get right down in there right i think there's some scenarios where the bunker provides some value like, you know, it could just be, you know, like New Zealand, right? There is such a thing as like, okay, we, we kill half the world's population with nuclear winter, but then the other half like slowly survives and you get a leg up on surviving. You got a few years yep. of canned food or whatever and before crops can grow. Like there is some scenario like that, but I think everybody would agree, even the people building the bunkers that there, it's it's just, a, you know, you're talking about a small percentage of the future here. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just... Uh, you know, especially Sam Alban talks about abundance and, and this, this new world, uh, you know, like he believes in it. So I, it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, sort of yeah, like, and, and I, and I think they do, right. I, I don't, I don't think it's like they're, it's, nobody thinks it's their plan A to live in that bunker. Right. 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 No doubt. No doubt. All right. How about this? So strategically we're in the, the shit position. Like we, um, we're going to be wrong until the end. Right. If you say everything's fine. Yeah, you'll be right all the time, 
up until it's not. And if you say everything's wrong, you'll be wrong all the time up until it's not. I think what, it'll be what are you, what are you making I, think, I think more and more people will realize like, oh shit, oh shit. And you know, I think there will be like lots of warning shots of various degrees, but I also think that there will there it'll also be like harder and harder to stop for various reasons, right? So I I don't think that we're gonna successfully stop it. But I do think that there will be like enough moments where a lot of people have that reaction of being scared. Yeah. Any thoughts about how that actually happens? Like, do you, you know, like one of the things, I mean, I, I, a question I answer all the time when I talk about this stuff, people is they're like, how could AI kill me? And you have to sort of go into very, you know, people want to know, like, yeah. said, like, how does this thing get out of a screen right. into my body to make me cease breathing? One scenario that I think will wake up a lot of people is just things that uh, look and feel more like the Terminator robot from the movie, uh, which, and I think that movie did a good service portraying how AI can be like, dynamic you know like something because people are like it's it's intuitive remember i said ai is like it's clean right it doesn't feel like a dragon it feels like a floppy disk or something that can just like crash yeah. on you and it feels like look i've never interacted with a software program that i can't wrestle down you know like as, as a human like we can we can get in the mud right <laughs> like i can i can play dirty against right. this thing right where and there's an off switch at, if that doesn't work either right yeah there's like, an there's off switch something. Exactly. But if you watch the Terminator movie, you can see that the Terminator is the one who plays dirty, right? Like the Terminator is like very menacing. Like it can, it outmaneuvers you in so many different ways, right? It's stronger than you. It's very sneaky, right? Like it can like steal the voices of people you know, and like its physicality yeah. is amazing and like it can recover from a gunshot, no problem. So it's the one now that's, that's getting down and dirty with you. Um, right. So we're, we're going to see a qualitative shift where you see software as this like rigid kind of weak thing where it's like you can always kind of like poke it and like get it off its game but soon you'll be like you're the one who's off your game like it's so robust like it's going to be like you know an optimist robot or whatever it is but it's going to have like it's going to be fluid right like like the terminator and terminator movie like it's, you're actually going to intuitively perceive it the way that you do like a lion like oh man this is like a force to be reckoned with wow yeah, and then it's 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 like the sort of force multiplying aspect of it, where you'd have the best businessman being the best scientist, being the best artist, being the best, the best, the best, the best. You know, when you put that together, and you, and you have right, uh, you know, the the best biologist on earth is the best business person is the best this totally, this, yeah. this this yeah, this. and and the what is that, that I, equal? Right, and and I hope that that kind of mechanical lion that actually makes you feel as scared as interacting with a real lion that doesn't have like obvious vulnerabilities, like you can't just like push it over, you know, you can't like cow tip it or anything like that. Like it can really dominate you, right? Like it can it can tackle you down, no problem. Um, I'm hoping that that kind of technology will come out uh, before it can easily take over the internet, right? And then be like really intellectually smart. I'm hoping that we'll get a warning shot, a physical warning shot, because I think that those kind of uh, physical robots can be like very intuitively scary even before we get the stuff running wild on the internet. But in terms of order of events, I, I have no idea. I think it's just as likely that the internet will get taken over and, and the attack will kind of start from, from the internet before we even see these physical robots. And and uh, does that look like everybody wakes up and everybody's accounts are at zero or something? Or, you know, it's just, it's trying you know, to create this, chaos? Yeah. This problem is always a, a little tough to reckon with of like explaining the answer of like, okay, so how are we going to die, right? Because there's kind of like a few different tiers to answer the question in. So yeah. the, the the bazooka is the sci-fi tier that Aliazar Yudkowsky focuses on, which is like, look, if the AI has enough time to think and enough intelligence, it can find basically cracks in the causality of the universe where it's like, oh, here is the DNA code to bootstrap some new type of life, like an aerovore life that's just like kind of better designed from the ground up than the life we've got. And then it can kind of dominate the air, grab energy from the sun, like self-assemble into a bunch of structures, like whatever, right? So there's a very sci-fi scenario where it's just like, yeah, I just got to manhandle every molecule on the earth to be how it wants. Uh, and then it can like, if it wants to take out all the humans, it can, uh, you know, be, it could be like a, a virus that lays dormant in you that gets like spread for a year and then it like triggers at the same time and everybody drops dead. So there's all these like yeah. sci-fi action moves that it can do, which to yeah. me are totally plausible just because for an intuition. I mean, I know today people have people feel like we're near the end of science and we just kind of like all the technology, we kind of know how technology works and we have an intuition for what it can and can't do. But I think that's wrong. I think you really have to compare the last few centuries of progress and imagine a few more centuries of progress compressed into 10 years if you want to get your sci-fi juices flowing um so yeah i do think the ai can just use sci-fi use futuristic tech to just take us out cleanly um but even before that i think there's likely to be sloppy ais where 
one of the most obvious things that it can do, even when it's not that much smarter than human, is just like help itself to every computer chip in the world, right? Via like an internet virus. Right. So that could be like a, a it just first takes move. over all the chips. So it has more compute power. It just takes all the combined compute of the world and, and gathers it for itself. Exactly. It's like all the computers are doing my bidding and it might be strategic about it. It might be like, okay, well, there are, I'm going to take 10% of every computer in the world, right? So it still functions normally as far as you can tell. And then it can just like work on whatever project it wants and it can do like a little bit of obfuscation. So you don't know that that's happened. And in the Ellie Eiser sort of world where, you know, we like ice cream and put a man on the moon, like we have no yeah. idea what it's ice cream and moon rocket would be, what it would want to do, what its goal would be. So the we Eliezer used the analogy of paper clips or the hypothetical of paper clips, and he originally yep. was talking about molecular little molecular squiggles that, right. that kind of yep. look like paper clips. Because his point is that when we don't really understand how to give AIs robust goals, but we're just using uh, black box feedback, you know, like RLHF, we're just yep. like upvoting and downvoting their responses. The structure that they end up learning that turns into a goal once they get into this goal optimization equilibrium uh this this goal optimization mode this like reflectively stable mode um they kind of converge into this mode once they get smart enough and then the goal that they end up optimizing toward because it was never cleanly specified in but it was just kind of an emergent from this feedback process then the optimum of that goal is just not something that we expected as humans like we didn't realize that by giving them these upvotes and downvotes and thinking that they were just like learning stuff that humans like in fact, they were learning like this really weird function that we just don't even get why that weird function would have this random optimum. And maybe molecular squiggles is the optimum of that function for whatever reason, right? The same way you can have like a turtle detector that just thinks like some random grid of pixels is like the most turtle thing in the universe, right? Just because like you didn't you didn't realize what the optimum of what it wants would be, but that's what it is. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's basically why Elias just says molecular squiggles. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I you know, uh, paperclip maximizer seems, you know, plausible to me. Have you, uh, do you, what are your thoughts on Computronium and, and that sort of yeah. outcome and, and my understanding of it being, um, you know, essentially all matter, right? This pen has, has atoms yeah. in it that are moving all around fighting each other. Sure. And, you know, there'd be an ideal structure that, right. that uh, an AGI could turn this pen into the ideal substrate for data. Right. And uh, you would turn this and the walls and the me and the everything <laughs> into the theoretical ideal substrate to compute uh, called computronium by in a, right. in a paper. And I think Ilya Sutskiver believes this to some degree because he said, hey, the earth is going to be full of data centers soon that the AI helps build. So, uh, I mean, instrumental convergence is the principle that tells you that there's going to be a lot of computronium because whatever you want to do to the universe, whatever you think is optimal for the universe having a lot of computers will probably help you get it. Just like having a lot of neg entropy, right? A lot of solar energy, whatever it is, will help you get it. Like there's certain resources that are useful to pretty much any goal. The only thing is that um, once the AI has done its initial burst of computation and kind of made a plan of how to optimize the universe, there's a good chance, in my mind at least, you know, I haven't read a research paper about this or anything, but it, it seems clear to me that it doesn't necessarily need maximum computing forever. It can kind of be like, okay, here's the game plan and then here are here are basically almost like ASICs but like here's problem specific computation that uses the the smallest possible chips right like the least possible overhead to just efficiently do the types of computations that we're going to need to optimize the universe for the molecular squiggles or right? for the exact problem I'm going to do now realistically I think it's going to encounter random things as it as it goes through the universe and it's probably going to want to then blow back up into like full computation mode but like it seems like overkill to have the entire universe having computronium unless the goal is to actually like compute consciousness or, or you know if the utility function specifies that you want to be doing a lot of computation like you want to have a lot of happy human experiences right those are types of computations in that case yeah you need a lot of comp uh, computronium but if the utility function just says what the eacs want to do which is like hey let's just burn energy as fast as we can to show that we're a prosperous civilization because prosperous civilizations burn energy in that case, I think that you can really save on computation. You can have like no consciousness, very little computronium. You can just like set up some black holes. Or I don't even know. I don't know the physics that well. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it seems to make all the sense in the world to me that it would just, you know, if that's what it wants to do, it just makes as much of it as it can and, you know, uh, finds a way to access different parts of the universe using physics. We don't understand a technology we don't understand. And uh, mm -hmm. we made it happen.
Um, yeah, and, and I agree that there's going to be there's going to be physics. We don't, you know, there's going to be quote unquote miracles, right? Uh, Eliezer likes to use the, t- the term miracles, but like, yes, I do think that it's like I can't tell you what the AI is going to do to the universe because I think it's going to do the equivalent of discovering things like, hey, I can make my refrigerator cold by using principles of the relationship between pressure and temperature. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like humans didn't used to know that that was a thing, but it is. Right. Like, well, I mean, it, it would be ridiculous to think that humans today in 2024 know even a reasonable fraction of the actual laws of physics, right? Like we we have a sliver of the laws of physics that so, we've been able to- that, that's a good question though. That, it's, it's a good question. We might be close to knowing most of their flavor, right? So like, I'm not convinced that there's like so many laws of physics we don't know. And, and physics isn't my specialty, but like, it seems like most of the phenomena that we observe that influences the, the stuff that we see is like, sure, we don't know like the smallest quarks. We don't know the, the string theory, but- it seems like the the mechanisms are understood on the relevant levels of abstraction. So the only thing that it'll tell us when we work out the string theory is it'll just give us a little bit more detail about why the lowest levels that we do know kind of do know what they do. Like, okay, quantum theory, we, we get quantum theory works a certain way and it makes a lot of precise predictions. So everything that works because of quantum theory, it doesn't really matter what's below quantum theory in the theory of everything. Like We already understand how the things above quantum theory work in terms of quantum theory. Okay. Okay. Right. So, right. So, I, um, I don't think there's, I, I don't think there's going to be that many breakthroughs in physics. But I also, I do think that you, you can't know what you don't know, right? So, we're probably going to discover like some unknown unknown of like, oh wow, okay. So this, this, I guess, like computation can go a lot faster than we thought. Like, there's going to be like some a few unpredicted things coming out. But I just, I don't think that. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if we discover like the theory of everything, and it doesn't help us that much technologically. Wow, interesting. Um. Uh, so I'm not a religious person in any way, but I think sometimes about a potential role for organized religion in this fight to slow AI. Uh, you know, the Pope has spoken out against it. Um, I yeah. think an all-powerful sand god is probably not good business for any religion. Uh, and and it, it almost seems like if you could have the, you know, the leaders of the religions of the world unite against AI that almost seems more doable than getting the governments to unite against AI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's helpful. And I think it's great that the Pope right, came out and said, hey, this AI seems dangerous. And like, I know Mitt Romney is like, I'm so terrified of the AI threat. So like, look, a lot of these people who are outside the tech bubble, it is like their default reaction. I haven't seen that many random figures like that be like, I am not scared at all of AI. Like, let's go forward. Like, I haven't really seen random normal people come out and say that. Like, it, it just seems like this is what sane people say. Of like, let's tread carefully. So I don't have a lot of insight personally uh, about how we're going to make the social movement happen. I just try to find points that seem to have clear leverage. Like, I think the existence of Pause AI protests, which by the way, I'm wearing my Pause AI t-shirt, right? So I think, awesome. the, yeah. Yeah, I think having people gather and make it public knowledge that pausing AI is like an urgent issue worth protesting, I do think that that's a high leverage point uh, because the converse of not doing protests and then being like, well, if this is such an important issue, where are the protests? Right. So that seems like a high leverage point to me. And not only that, but how can the politicians make a decision to lead the people if they don't detect that there's a groundswell? Right. So like we have to create the groundswell. Right. No, I'm so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm of, of, two minds with with the protests my first mind is like yes thank you like i think youp is incredible and what pause ai is doing is is awesome and and you know i've been talking to him and i'll do everything i can to support it in every any way i can um and then you also see the pictures of the protests and you know there's less people than there are at a junior high school soccer game and you're like jesus this is a high hill (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean it's right, and that's and when you do the protests, it's uh, it's it's a little dispiriting of like, oh man, we need like a million people, and we have like thirty. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's but you know, I I do think thirty is a lot better than zero. And the funny thing is that we do get good coverage for the protests. Um, so there is absolutely an appetite when people are saying like, oh wow, AI is racing ahead. It does leave an appetite to be like, okay, well wait, who's who's on the other side of this, right? Who's worrying us? So. That's why, you know, a tiny protest is currently getting coverage. So whatever protests we can do, at at least we're going to, you know, have our side get some, some notoriety, but like, look, it's, it's all about, we have to get urgency with like regular people. Right. And that's still an unsolved problem. And I'm open to ideas, how to, how to get through, but like, look, it's, it's tough because it's so theoretical, right? It's just like, Hey, this thing is coming and, and they're just not connecting it to 
experiences they're saying they're like why because i can go online and ask google an ai question right so like i think the people are always that i think we're laying the groundwork where once there's hopefully some kind of warning shot then maybe the people will have a movement to run to because they'll see the urgency i feel all that and i, I when i talk to people about it i don't ever try to foot it in like here's what i think my my whole mode right. is like Read what they say. Read the 22 yeah. word statement signed by all the CEOs where they right. say in the first seven words, it is an existential risk, right? So they say it's an existential right. risk. They also say they don't understand it. They also say they can't control it. And they're also spending all their money to make it stronger, not safer. Yeah. Like, that's no, where we are. It's, it's crazy, right? And yeah, I do think that the AI labs are being logically inconsistent. I mean, the the craziest thing, I, I wrote an article for The Information pointing out when OpenAI announced their super alignment effort, I'm like, wow, this is this contradiction is so bare. Like, forget what Leron Shapira and the Doomers think. OpenAI just admitted, which in retrospect, it was like largely Ilya's doing, right? Like Ilya was feeling uncomfortable, but they, they just admitted publicly that they don't have a way to align super intelligent AI. The approach that they're using to align their current subhuman intelligent AI, that approach, RLHF and, and the, the extra steps there, fine tuning, all those different steps, um, those don't generalize to super intelligence because super intelligence can game the alignment process, right? So it's, it's too good of a test taker. You can It can pass all your tests and then still optimize the universe for something you didn't intend. So they've publicly admitted that. And then they said, okay, no problem. We're just going to start a team called Super Alignment and we're going to figure out how to align it. And we're giving ourselves a timeline of four years. And is our chance of success high? It's not that high because there, you know, there's prediction markets saying, yeah, their chance of success isn't that high, 15% last time I checked. And like, okay, great. So that's our team. We're going to give 20% of our compute resource to that team and we're going to keep building the AI as fast as we can. It's like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just admitted you just have a Hail Mary like this is all just a hail mary to make it safe. and it's and like half of it's like fucking branding like we're just going to put the word super in front of a line yeah. and be like right 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 we got this it's super right what? so it's just like so so how does their own logic square that right it's like forget forget what i think how does their own logic say square that saying like we better align this in 4 years and also we're going to raise ad right so and of course so they probably trot out the the usual lines of like well you know, this is just, this is how fast the tech is going to go. It's not, we don't really set the pace. We're just racing with everybody else. This is a racing stage, right? So I'm sure they'd have like excuses, but it's just like, I think this is what the average person, this may be the most effective thing to tell the average person or the average regulator of like, look what they're telling you that they're doing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. They admit it all. Like it's, they, yeah. they literally say the whole thing right out there. Um, How close do you really think we are to AGI? Any I know it's a, the definition. Yeah, so I, I, I say P doom. I say P doom fifty percent by twenty forty, which I think, you know, people. Uh, there's a lot of people who are outside of the doom community who are just like, what are where are these probabilities coming from? But what they don't get is when I say fifty percent, I'm not saying fifty point zero zero zero. I'm not saying forty nine to fifty one. I'm saying like ten to ninety percent. I'm saying this is the ballpark, meaning it's clearly much higher than one to five percent. Like it's clearly much more of a threat than that. To that that AI will be super intelligent and uncontrollable by 2040, uh, and it's clearly not a 95% threat, right? Like there there's some possibility that it won't, right? So the ballpark is like, yeah, this is something that like really might actually plausibly happen. That's why I say 50%. Like, and and I'm I wouldn't really be more surprised if it happened or didn't happen. I will admit that on some intuitive gut level, I will have the same shock reaction as many techno optimists when I see that lion, right? When I, I'm like, oh man, I can't wrestle this thing, right? So I, I do expect to, on a gut level, feel like this is a surprise, even though on an intellectual level, I know like, no, I'm not going to be able to wrestle the best lion-shaped AI that they're going to come out with by 2040. But intuitively, you'll be like, oh crap, <laughs> right? Like, um, yeah, but, but anyway, so to your question, like when do I really think it's coming? Yeah, I mean, that's roughly my timeline, right? I mean, just ex extrapolating, I mean, I think, it's like 2040. Yeah, 2040 Ish. because I I don't see I don't see a secure firewall protecting human level intelligence in in concept space from where we are right now with AI. Like yeah, we're not there yet. There's some secret sauce that humans can do, right? But like look, we're at the end of the day we're just a piece of meat that just evolved with a few genetic base pairs away from the apes, and the apes aren't that smart. 2040 seems a little bit optimistic to me. I I I, I like it. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah, know, yeah. Like I that's mean, a long. What happens in this in this sixty yeah, years I, here? 
well, I think there's a 20% chance that it goes rogue in the next five years, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I've got like a whole, you know, bell curve of probabilities. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if they, if they made AGI, uh, do you think OpenAI or whoever made it would, would come out and have a press conference and say we made it or would they try to keep it secret? I can see sort of big incentives both ways. Well, I, it's, I think that it'll naturally be hard to trace it to a single event. I mean, when I think of single events, uh, the output of a training run is naturally a single event because they don't really know it's, um, I'm not sure how much insight they have into it before it's kind of like done and then they can poke around with it once it's done. That's, that seems to be how the GPT-4 process worked. Like they didn't really know what was happening until the model's like, okay, I'm fully baked, test me. And then they did and like, oh, wow, it's doing this stuff, right? So, and it's what Jan Tolin calls summon and tame like let's summon the demon and let's like let's do our lhf let's make sure it behaves well so if they summon a new demon that turns out to be like super smart it's probably not going to be super intelligent but like you said maybe it's agi so maybe gpt5 if it's 10x bigger than gpt4 maybe they'll be like oh wow like i talked to this person and this person this ai person and it doesn't seem fundamentally weaker than any smart human that i talked to right like it's not making any obvious mistakes like it's really like with it can it take over the world yet? There's a good chance that it won't. Like there's a good chance that we'll have like a year or however long of times when it's like merely still in the human range, like merely 140 IQ or whatever it is, right? And it can't take on everybody quite yet. Um, will they announce it? I mean, I think it'll probably leak, right? I mean, things leak, right? They have like a lot of employees, right? So I think it'll leak. I don't think that they'll try to hide it. Um, I think that the reason is it won't be so binary. Like if they instantly, if tomorrow they wake up and they're like, oh my God, we have something that's super intelligent that you can input a goal and it'll optimize the universe. I just don't think that'll ever happen. It'll always be continuous enough that it'll like leak, right? Like the information secrecy won't be like this huge factor. Right. And then like, do you think like the defense department knows what's going on? Like, for example, I would think that the defense department and the president should really know what happened at OpenAI the weekend Sam Altman got fired and the whole situation. Like, like yeah. it seems to me there's absolutely national security level things that happened that weekend. Um, I mean, the, maybe the, the national security level thing is, just, I think, is just like what's going on with AI training in general, right? So it sounds like you're making a couple inferential steps. You're saying, well... The government needs to know to be on the on the cutting edge of what's happening with the next training run, and therefore it needs to have all the AI organizations under pretty tight surveillance. And therefore, if there's like a government shakeup, then it needs to have good insight in that. Right? That's kind of like your logical change. Yeah, it's kind of, I'm like somebody should be watching the Jenga game. Yeah, you know, like if oh, they're just totally. playing Jenga yeah, in yeah, a closet totally. with themselves. Yeah. No, I mean, I'll, I agree, right? And it's just, I don't know if I would start by uh, by trying to make a change at that level, right? I might start, I might go back to the original step in the logic and be like, let's have the government explicitly say that it's its mission to to regulate. Yeah, I mean, kind of like what the executive order did of like, okay, well, we're going to keep an eye on training runs, you know, models above a certain size. Like that was a pretty good first step, right? Like it needs many more steps, but coming from there and then and then being like, well, okay, and therefore we need to know what the AI labs are doing. Um, that's fine. But one, by the time you get to that step, you might already even need the international treaty. Like it's kind of pointless to only monitor your own country. You need to monitor the whole world. Right. And, and, uh, you know, uh, y your thoughts on that, just as we sort of wrap up here, people, you know, the quickest thing to do is the old China point and, yeah. you know, if we don't, they will thoughts on yeah. China. Well, my, my first thought is anytime somebody, this is like so popular for people to be like, Okay, Liron, you make a good case why AI is dangerous and maybe we should pause it. But that's not an option. You have to accept it as an axiom that it's not going to be paused and then go from there. And I'm like, wait, no, <laughs> let, let me do the other way. How about you have to accept it as an axiom that we're going to die if we don't pause it? <laughs> right? It's like, that's, I want, can I submit an axiom? Because it's just yeah. like, yeah, we're between a rock and a hard place. Like, I agree. But like, I would argue that my place is harder, right? Like, that's the crux of the argument is, Unfortunately, I think that it's so likely that we're going to die on the current trajectory that, yeah, I think that we have to move heaven and earth to get off the current trajectory. So telling me that getting the world to coordinate is moving heaven and earth, okay, well, I still pick that. That That is the only road to walk. Right, and in my mind. And you can see with nuclear proliferation, like there's no like, let's just grit our teeth and let the nukes proliferate. It's like, nope, we moved heaven and earth to stop nuclear proliferation because it's freaking scary. Right. And there was a need, you know, obviously everybody understood um, after those those detonations. So uh, two final questions. Is there anything that would ever cause you to just say, 
I give up. Fuck it. I'm moving my family to the beach and we're just going to watch the sunset for as long as we can. I mean, to some degree, I've, I've, I've done it with half of my brain, right? So like half of my brain is living in the future where we're going to die. And so like, hey, I'm having a nice day. I'm not saving and investing quite as much as I would be if, if I thought that we had a long time horizon, right? So half of my action policy is under the idea of like, yeah, timelines are short and I'll you know, live more for the present, right? Short term, which is kind of ironic because us effective altruism types were known for like long termism. But I would argue that there's a pretty good case for short termism in terms of where the future's added. Yeah. And and um, last question, what, what sort of gives you hope? Is there anything that gives you hope? Uh, let's see. I mean, so naturally, right, it's uh, the way that I react to it on a, an emotional level is I'm not super emotional about it. I feel because I feel all these good intuitions like, oh, AI is clean, right? Like the line's not really going to happen, right? <laughs> like my, my gut hasn't fully updated to how screwed we are. Like intellectually, I'm like, oh, we seem pretty freaking screwed. But my gut is like, hey, man, it's such a nice day. Oh, wow, this new technology is coming out. This is so much better than what I had when I was a kid. Like, oh, I live in California. It's like such a nice state. Yeah, at least in terms of weather. Um, right. So it's like, oh, this is like a nice day. I got to see my family today and I got to like do something fun at my day job. Right. So like, I'm not really depressed. Um, but then in terms of like what gives me hope just on a purely intellectual level, like how will we sur survive? There's always unknown unknowns and there's always the idea of like, oh my God, it turns out that like something you just get a surprise. Like, oh, for some reason, instrumental convergence, for some reason, nobody's spelled out yet as far as I can tell. But like, it turns out that the AIs just aren't that power hungry for whatever reason, even though it really, really, really seems like they would be power hungry. Like there's a lot of really convincing arguments that they would be. But like, imagine we build them and they're like super smart and they're like smarter than human. And they really just aren't power hungry somehow, right? Like all these little, so you, you can undermine, you can undermine any step uh, in the, in the doom argument. Like you can potentially hope that one of the steps is flawed. Unfortunately, we keep having people checking the steps and they seem robust, but like, you know, or one way we can win is if timelines just become really long, like, oh, wow, it turns out that the LLM paradigm plateaued and we just have, we got 20 years. Nice. So like we still die, but it's 20 years later than otherwise, because there's like another AI winter or something. Right. So, yeah. Or like, or maybe, maybe in a gap, we'd have a chance to do something to, right. Exactly. Work yeah. Around it. That's right. Okay. So, to be fully optimistic, so we get a 20 year AI winter, and then somehow people get scared and they do a serious safety effort. Um, and then they solve safety, and then we build the AI, and then we get heaven. Right. So, there are these possible optimistic scenarios. They seem unlikely, but like, you can't, nobody's giving a 0% probability. Right. Yeah, I love that one. I mean, because I can totally like I really believe that if we could slow down 50 to 100 years later, if we do it right, it's not clean. It's not 100 percent. But there's a decent probability that like we could get to that utopian future. But we are just so human, so greedy, so short sighted that like literally humanity is going to undo humans in the end. Yeah, and it, it sucks because it's a hard coordination problem. I and mean, you get that first uncontrollable AI, like you lose. You know, it's 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 a really unforgiving game over situation. It's kind of like detonating a hundred megaton or a five five hundred megaton, right? Like a single nuke that, that can blow up the earth, right? Maybe that's a little bit far fetched, but it's it's the, the right order of magnitude. I think most people would agree a single nuke can probably take out ten percent of the population. So I imagine a nuke that's a little bigger than that, thermo nuke. Um, so we have a single button in terms of AI, right? One push of that button and it's game over. Uh, and it's just, and the button can be accidentally pushed, right? So we're talking about a very hard problem that almost certainly needs decades, if not more. And yeah. we're just not on the trajectory of giving it the attention, the, t the time it's going to require. Yeah, I think I think maybe that your the greatest hope is in, that there's something unknown that comes along that that you know yeah. blows away the likelihood. Yeah, I mean, we're all absolutely hoping for a miracle. And look, I'm only saying 50% by 2040, right? And I'll, maybe I'll throw out a number like, okay, I think that it's like 70% by 2060, right? So like it's, it, but my, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't ask them to, toward 100%. I think I, I probably top out around 70% because 30, the other 30% comes from like, most of us don't want to die, right? And most of us will get scared if we see more evidence that we should get scared. So like, so we might fight it away, right? Even though I, I can't tell you how, I mean, you saw when I tried to tell you an optimistic scenario, it seemed pretty tough and yet I'm still open to it, right? So I'm holding out some hope. Awesome. Well, listen, I, I uh, got to know you through your uh, Twitter account and I super appreciate what you're doing out there. Um, and I just think we need a bunch of us 
people out there, you know, doing everything we can to shout this from the rooftops because no one is literally hearing it right now. Totally. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the podcast. I'm going to go through the backlog right now. It's that that's great. I mean, the world needs it. What an awesome guy, right? He takes his own time. Uh, which is very valuable to try to save the damn world. Um, go follow Liron on Twitter or X. It is at L-I-R-O-N. Okay. Next week, another really interesting show on the way and an exciting announcement. I will be giving an in-person two-hour talk on AI risk in the Philadelphia area in March. Details of that coming next week. Um the subject of next week's show is not for the faint of heart. It is the darkest corner of the AI risk universe. It is where extinction is not the worst case scenario. Next week, we will get into S risk or suffering risk. It is heavy stuff. But before we go there, it is 2024. And on this show... We are celebrating life and being human every week. We revel in something that makes us thrilled to be alive and thrilled to be human. This week, I want to spotlight the incredible Warren Wolf, who lives here in Baltimore, as I do. Um, Warren is one of the most acclaimed vibraphonists to ever live. He's a graduate of the Berklee College of Music and a lecturer here in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins Peabody Institute. But more than any of that, he's a... a professional musician, a playing artist, and um, he is just so amazing to watch and listen to. He's like a human hummingbird. His, his hands move so fast, and I just love the sound of the instrument, the vibraphone. So this is a recording from 2015 from Berkeley College of Music. Here is the great Warren Wolf.
amazing Warren Wolf. Humans are pretty incredible. I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, friends, four quick things you can do this week to help save the world from AI doom. Number one, talk to a friend about it. Convince the people closest to you that know you the best first. I know it's hard. I know it takes time. It is worth the effort. Do it. Um, Share this podcast on your social channels. It's free. It's easy. If you believe these things are important, um, if you believe I'm making a convincing case here on these shows, please help me spread the word. It's important. Uh, come to the pause AI discord meeting. It's really cool. It's a weekly meeting where you can meet other people all over the world who are fighting for these issues. Uh, you can learn how you can help them and they can help any efforts that you are undertaking. Uh, right now the meetings are Thursdays at 2 PM Eastern standard U S time. I'll put a link in the description here. Now, and last thing is write your congressperson or elected leader, right? That's how change happens. They need to know what their constituents want. Let them know that you are very concerned about AI risk. Um, there's a very exciting development in California this week with a state Senate bill targeting AI risk that seems like a meaty effort and a great start. I'll put a link uh, to more about California State Senate Bill SB 1047 in the the description here, and we'll talk much more about it in the coming weeks. Friends, our hope is our health, so do not be discouraged. We can do this, people. We really can. As Liron says, there are known unknowns that may save us after all. Nobody is saying we are certainly all going to die. What we're saying is we are running a ridiculously high risk that we are all going to die. We can take steps to save ourselves or we can continue as we're going and end all life on earth. It is our choice. And the general public is completely asleep to all of it. Remember, now, there are only three kinds of people in the world. Firefighters, 
arsonists and people asleep in their beds. We need millions of firefighters because the arsonists have all the money and all the momentum. So we're going to stop a few thousand people from doing this to 8 billion unaware, unconsenting human beings, clueless that tech bros in the valley are playing Russian roulette with their children's lives. We're going to stop them. We have no other choice. Failure is not an option. Failure is the end of the world. For Humanity, I'm John Sherman. I will see you right back here next week.